Hey guys, how's it going? My name is Arden and today we're talking about what makes a comic good. So this is one of those ideas, <laughs> stupid phone. This is one of those ideas, this is one of those things where my phone goes off when a new video is posted. So it's just the phone telling me about its own stream. Anyways, have oh, a good- Oh, so it's not actually on? Oh no, it's on. But oh. anyways, <laughs> have a good one, darling. <laughs> See you later. Uh, but uh, like I was saying, no. Uh, we were just moving around some stuff before, <laughs> but uh, okay. So that was uh, that's my girlfriend. But uh, uh, where is my? Uh, I completely, completely lost what I was uh, talking about there. But uh, oh yeah, this was uh, this has been one of those ideas that's been sitting on for a while. It's just like a video I wanted to make, but rather than like carefully editing and putting together a script, it felt more like a discussion worth having and one that would benefit from people being able to respond in chat and that sort of thing. And the idea itself has been around for a long, long time because it's always something I've thought about as a reviewer, but even just in the ongoing conversation back and forth between like potential, uh, like or like like viewers and their comments they leave in response to comics and whether or not they like them and my own opinions and whether or not I like them and wondering often I'll describe a comic as being either good or bad uh, without really getting into the specifics of it especially when we're talking about a broad range of comics all at once and that difficulty can be very uh, like tough to navigate um, or like a deal with, we'll say. Uh, Tevia Raphael, thank you for joining me. <laughs> uh, Vanilla Gorilla, and say in response to the question, what makes a good comic? He says, well, definitely not DC Comics, but this is less about uh, some sort of rib at either of the big two, or even really just specifically about them, and more of a broad discussion about what, like, what are we going to do in terms of like how like how do we evaluate these things? Because I, where where I'm hedging, I guess, is there is obviously these subjective things where a book can really speak to me in a way that it doesn't for other people. Uh, a good example of that would be something like Mister Miracle by Tom King and Mitch Gerards. That book, for whatever reason, really hit a chord with me emotionally. We've had comic story on before, and she just happened to mention the same thing. But a lot of other Tom King books, like his Batman run, Strange Adventures, uh, I'm forgetting one, but uh, some of these other books that I haven't really connected with, other people do. And that's okay too. So that mishmash is, uh, is kind of just something uh, that like, uh, I think is worth talking about a little bit today. Andre Partridge, thanks for joining us uh, with the little wavy emoji. What? Who was that? <laughs> Weird. <laughs> Something beeped over there. <laughs> I, I don't even know what that was, but okay. Uh, now I'm just watching myself yelling at my room uh, in the camera. But uh, anyways, regardless. Uh, <laughs> the, the, so I guess the first thing to talk about is uh, Raphael says, a good comic is a comic with my favorite characters. Well, that's an interesting point. I was going to say the first thing to talk about is art, but maybe let's, let's start on Raphael's point instead. So characters is actually a really good and interesting question. A good character can keep you reading into a book and invested in it. And even if a book doesn't technically have much to its individual issue, there's a lot of series I've read where we have like a hundred issues. <laughs> Raphael says, I just noticed the window. So what it is, is just sheer light exposure. Those are big windows that go up a lot taller than you guys realize right up to that ceiling there. So uh, there's a lot of light coming in. <laughs> I, I like it, just this heavenly abyss. And then like the happy little chime came from it. <laughs> but uh, John Pierre says, uh, oh, and thanks for joining us again. We were chatting before and I kind of, yeah, uh, we had a whole thing. Uh, Tom King, Batman is what I think of when someone says bad comic. Well, I don't know if I'd go that far. I didn't like those comics, but when I think of a bad comic, I think of something like Frank Miller's 
later body of work. I was going to say All-Star Batman and Robin, but he has a lot of examples from recent time that like Spawn comic he did. Uh, that like Middle East book, I, I forget what it's even called off the top of my head, but that gets into something I wanted to talk about because I would say Tom King's Batman is a little more subjective because you also have these earmarks of quality. And I've read plenty of stinky comics <laughs> with beautiful, gorgeous artwork that look phenomenal. The best example I can come up with in that regard is actually Civil War II from Marvel's end. Uh, like some of the best artwork you'll see in a book and just one of the worst stories. It's a, it's a horrible combination. And so one could argue a story is more important, but then you also have bad comics where the story's fine, but the artwork is really bad and rough or rushed or any number of other things. Sometimes there's printing errors. So, and, and the other thing, and I kind of talked about this a little bit in the video description is, I think this also gets into how media is criticized. Shadowcatcher, thanks for joining us. You missed the last stream. <laughs> and I don't mean to rib you for it. You just commented about it on the last stream. And so it's like, hey, I'm happy for you that you made it too. Um, <laughs> and, but what I was saying is, before I read your comments, because it might be worth getting this out first, there's plenty of excellent critics out there. I think you look at film reviewers like uh, Red Letter Media, and I think they sort of can navigate authentic criticism with entertaining content. And then you look at something like Cinema Sins, and they don't really call themselves criticism, but a lot of people will kind of take that approach and just point out plot holes. But I would argue some of my favorite movies, books, comics are full of plot holes. <laughs> Uh, I would say a plot hole is less important than if it's a bad comic, you're going to notice those plot holes a lot more. So the good or badness kind of gets beyond how criticism is typically discussed in a lot of things. And I actually see this, not to call anyone out specifically because I wouldn't be able to, but just generally in comments, I do see from time to time people kind of make that mistake and identifies a story as good or bad or a movie or whatever, simply on the grounds of, well... It did X, Y, and Z, uh, and this didn't make perfect sense, or it didn't explain everything along the way, and so it wasn't good. But then I look at something, or think of something, like David Lynch's Twin Peaks, or his body of work, and it's like, well, those things are full of plot holes and unexplained bits that are deliberately there for people to sort of cobble together. We, like, you don't need David Lynch to do that. There's... Uh, I, we were watching uh, Studio Ghibli, uh, Princess Mononoke, and uh, there's a lot of stuff where it's like, well, they don't need to explain everything along the way because it's entertaining and beautifully animated, which carries it. So, well, let's go into comments before we move on to some other, whatever I was getting at there. Andre says, uh, in my opinion, what makes a good comic is when you have a chance to tell an impactful story that both resonates with the problems of everyday people while also inspiring them to be better people as well. Well, damn. I would say that is like dead on for a superhero, like a traditional superhero comic. But I, the only caveat I have there is you do sometimes have, especially in the more indie world, kind of books that aren't necessarily focusing on protagonists that are good people. And then you have stuff with non-traditional forms of narration where it doesn't necessarily have inspirational figures. And those could be excellent comics. Uh, and you can even have a superhero book from Marvel or DC, like The Punisher or something like that, where the morality is far more gray. Suicide Squad's a good, especially the early pre New 52 style su Suicide Squad stuff uh, can really get into that a little bit, which I like. So I don't disagree with Andre Partridge. And I definitely think uh, the impactful story that resonates with the problems or just even not the problems of everyday people, but just resonates in some way with everyday people. I think part of the issue and part of the reason why it's a debate, but also part of the fun of comics or media, like fiction in general, is we can talk about these things. <laughs> you know, you're talking about November. To be fair, there's a little bit more than just like mustache. I, okay, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I uh, we'll see how it goes. I've just stopped shaving. <laughs> Uh, Tevia says, Bendis Superman is what I think of as a terrible comic with a terrible story that destroyed the Superman family. 
you know, so I hate the Bendis Superman books too. But again, that kind of gets into, well, like the art is competent and the story is well structured. There aren't a ton of plot holes, but the larger context of the narrative does kind of make it bad because it's enormously less. And it kind of gets into what Andre was saying. Like you don't, I don't connect with the Superman of Brian Michael Bendis compared to the writer who came before with Dan Jurgens and that it was Tomasi doing Superman uh, with him. But uh, I, I am kind of with people on that, that, that like it, it is a bad comic. It's just, it gets into what the discussion is today is there's all these different things. I think, I really do believe on the farthest extreme. So we're gonna, here, I'm gonna let my, move my this over a bit so I can do this. We have on this end, we're going to create an imaginary scale from here to here. I could even draw this out live with you guys, but we don't need to. On the far end here, I think we have objectively bad content. Uh, your your later your late era Frank Miller's, uh, some of your Mark Millar books, stuff that just... To anyone who lives in our culture and agrees to certain basic norms and principles around storytelling are just bad. Stuff like shoving bombs up of wombs just for the sh sake of shock value bad. I can't put into definitive terms where that starts and ends because you just kind of know it when you see it, but you do see it. And there are these comics that just end up on these like, like infamous because they end up on these worst of lists, including stuff we've put out and everyone ends up talking about them. And uh, I do think so on the far end, we have that. Next up, we kind of oop, we're going in the wrong direction. Next step, we kind of have stuff where it's like, well, there's a lot of problems, and problems that people can't easily ignore, like sketchy art or something like that. But people can still find value in it, even if it most people don't like it. And then from that point on in the scale, all the way up to stuff that I would argue even kind of gets into objectively good territory, which to me means stuff that like pushes the boundaries of what these like comics can do and tell, or just does something truly exceptional that no other book has done before. Uh, all these sort of things. Ah, so I was talking about Tom King's stories and there was one I was talking about that didn't connect to me. Heroes in Crisis, uh, Tevye Smoke had just mentioned. That feels like a pretty solid example of something kind of on this end of the scale, right on the verge of being objectively bad. But again, it's like, well, if people connected with that, like I don't want to stand in the way of it too much. And again, like it has gorgeous artwork and it, it becomes a frustrating thing. But I think to really get to here on the, my imaginary scale, where you're in the territory where it's like, well, if someone's saying it's bad or like completely without value, they're just being contrarian. You need to have both good art and good writing because anything short of that immediately moves it farther and farther down the scale where people have more stuff they can object to and not nitpicky like stuff about the plot and such. Now, to be fair, I am guilty of nitpicking things, but it's something we kind of naturally do. When a story's bad, we start looking for reasons why we're not connecting with it. And if a story gives us lots of reasons, it's very easy to come up with them. I also think there's sort of like a threshold. So plot holes won't bother people for the most part. And like, if it's bad, it'll get there. But also if a plot hole's too ridiculous, it'll go past that point. I'm gesturing a lot for this stream, I guess, because I have, I don't have to deal with like the images over there or anything. I got the full, full set going. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll reach out more in a sec, but uh, I'm on a rant here, I guess. Uh, and uh, so my point being, I guess like, because comics are this mixed art, for, uh, mixed art form, you, an objectively, bad comic generally has bad art and bad writing and an objectively good one has good art and good writing and everything in between is this kind of subjective argument and I would argue as long as we aren't getting hostile with each other it's open for debate <laughs> um, Tevye Smoka says the boys by Garth Innes is extremely brutal and really not great at least in my opinion well, that gets into an interesting thing, too, of adaptation and stuff like that, because I find there are a lot of movies out there like The Kingsman, Kick-Ass, or The Boys that take these books and actually adapt it into something productive. Although that is kind of its own discussion, uh, which we might do one day. Uh, Mr. Fahrenheit says, have you watched Superman and Lois? I did not know that was out yet. <laughs> I kind of heard something in the news about it, but I... So, no, I haven't. I'll have to... Uh, 
keep an ear out for that, figure out how one goes about watching it in Canada, and then perhaps watch that tonight. And I'll let you all know. <laughs> uh, Cesar Augusto Rodriguez Montiego uh, says, Hi buddy, love your videos. You too, man. I hope I got your name at least close to right. <laughs> uh, Raphael says, uh, it's an interesting time for comics with political correctness, inclusivity of all types of real world people, and being a product of a dying time and adapting to survive the future. Yeah, that's, there's elements of truth there. I think um, that conversation or those talking points you're referring to there, and I like, don't object too much to the term talking points there. I'm just saying I've heard that a lot before, certainly not just from Raphael. Um, but I think that discussion tends to really minimize the role of like scholastic book sales, the international market, all these avenues for potential success that continue to exist. Um, and part of, what am I trying to say here? Oh yeah, okay, you know, part of the struggle of like the big two and traditional comic book companies is adapting with these times. But you wouldn't believe how late into the game DC like woke up to the idea of there being youth comics and scholastic book sales worth millions of dollars that they weren't tapping into. This like this is developments within the company that like only occurred to them within the last decade or so. So what Raphael is describing there, I would say, yeah, like you know, there's all that stuff about political crisis and whatever, like what and all this struggle with the shops and stuff. I think what it really comes down to is mismanagement and these companies failing to adapt and i think dc is actually doing a lot better these days at changing with the times and they've kind of shedded a lot of their baggage baggage being didio harris jeff johns <laughs> all these people of old power who didn't get it and never really understood that and they're kind of struggling because you have all these other companies that are kind of flourishing at the same time Todd McFarlane's doing all these cool new things, all these little web groups and web comics, Kickstarter funded things are existing perfectly fine on their own, um, with or without any logo or label associated with them. So I would say that I kind of disagree with you, Raphael. I think it's a little more complicated than that. And I, I would also argue, while certainly there's examples in Marvel's history of like this like this move for diversity in a very inauthentic way that clearly showed they've also historically been really good at pushing it in the right direction and all this stuff about like so like all this stuff about political correctness is nonsense like all the business around the dr seuss books like if any of you can tell me what any of the censored dr seuss books are about you had to look it up ahead of time because uh, and, and they they did it to themselves it's not like anyone told them to pull these markets like that's the thing everyone's talking about like oh yeah the political characters though like it's it's fascism in some form it's not and i'm not coming down on Raphael here specifically this is other people i hear uh talking about this dr seuss and whatever publishing organization is behind it they have every right to not sell a book if they don't want to <laughs> Uh, every comp and and then we get into like Mar if Marvel wants to wipe out their normal cast and make it more diverse like that's that's free speech <laughs> and I, I kind of chafe when people get all up in arms about it now Marvel and Zeus and all these groups have to live with the consequences of their speech like everyone else so for Marvel they did really struggle with that because they went about it all wrong uh, and they're doing a lot better these days <laughs> with that kind of issue. And uh, yeah, okay, that's just my thoughts on the matter. I think the the whole conversation around that uh, that sort of thing uh, kind of threw me. Cesar says, surprised about your rating on Burns' run on the Avengers. Well, I really liked it. I I think uh, it had some interesting art moments, and I found it fun start to finish, however short it was. I didn't give it an A either, so <laughs> not like it was, but it was kind of in the threshold of my top 10. Like, I think it would rank at number 10 out of all the Avengers eras, but we'll, we'll leave that for next time. Uh, but uh, I guess we'll talk more about it because Cesar has some questions about it, but we don't really stream about, although I guess we are doing some now. I I'll talk, I'll, I'll answer your questions as we go. Uh, John Pierce says, uh, I reread Heroes in Crisis and thought it wasn't bad as when I first read it, but the art was more gorgeous. You know, I've read it twice because we made a video about it and I had to do the top 10 best things about Heroes in Crisis, which was 
a really interesting experience, actually, because I hate the story, so I had to find value in it. <laughs> and um, I did like it more the second time as well. But liking it more doesn't mean I like it. I still think it's... I really have a lot of issues with it. But uh, I, And that art is so good. And I think in my top ten, I included the art in a few different ways because there's a few different things to talk about, like the coloring and Clay Mann's work and stuff. So... Uh, it was a worthy discussion, to say the least. Um, where were we? So, Tevia says, take me away. Okay, yeah, we don't need to revisit Superman. We've talked about that already. Andre says, uh, I also think the comic book stories should be bad if they are either a complete rewrite or ignore all the hard work and dedication that came before a particular iconic character. Let me reread this. I, I think that uh, bad... I also think that comic book stories could be bad if they either completely rewrite or... Yeah, okay. Well, that actually directly ties into what Tevi was just saying about Superman, and we will bring it up again because of what Andre's point is. And while there are tons of examples of writers or artists creating something truly quality by going in a different direction, and even though I just talked about Jeff Johns in a pretty negative way, I'm going to actually use him as a pos positive example right now because he brought some serious changes to Green Lantern, and I think it was in a positive direction. And then Grant Morrison did some serious changes to Green Lantern, and I think it was in a positive direction. So you can rework these things, but both of those examples were pretty respectful of what came before, kind of getting to what Andre was saying. And then you get into something like Superman by Bendis, which isn't respectful of what came before, and if anything, like, kind of threw like puked all over the past arc and got rid of all the hard work that Andre was saying there that was established by Jurgens and I think, is it Tomasi? No one corrected me, so I'm going to guess I'm right, that uh, put into Superman before Bendis. So I, 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 uh, there's certainly a level where I agree with you, Andre, because yeah, if you're going to just, it kind of gets into like when J.J. Abrams was writing Spider-Man or if that's still a thing, like the, the, these, People, some people, some writers will come into a series and stuff with the sense of ego and thinking, oh, it doesn't matter what came before. I'm going to do my own thing. And while some writers have the talent to justify that, that's pretty rare. And usually it becomes frustrating. And I would argue if you're going to put the name of the character on the title, like Spider-Man, then it's going to be compared to past Spider-Man stories. And that's a fair comparison. You don't just get to have it exist as its own thing. That's not how any of this works. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like maybe a critic might, or even someone more with a background in literacy might argue to the contrary, but it's like at the very least, that's gonna be something that's gonna be brought up. And I think it's a fair criticism, especially if the thing created to replace it is of a lesser quality, which is often the case. If you are able to kind of really bring in these new ideas, like some of those examples I was giving before of Green Lantern, or a different character, because it's been done a ton of times before where a character gets completely reimagined. Grant Morrison's actually a really good example of that because he does that with a lot of Golden Age characters. And I'm not necessarily against that personally, uh, especially because someone like Morrison is trying out new things and adding something to it with value. Jeff Johns is a good example of that to Green Lantern. There's a lot of people that hate what Jeff Johns did to Green Lantern, but I would argue there's tremendous value produced in the, out of these stories, even if you don't particularly like the actual stories. They're like There's a lot of cool characters and ideas created out of it, the Rainbow Core and all that, and I'm not really against that. <laughs> um, Cesar says, the boys are really predictable and boring. The TV show is way better. Well, that gets into what I was saying earlier about like adaptation. But I think that's a very different conversation. And I don't mind, you know, I agree with you guys. I just think uh, that's like, that's a whole other stream I might want to do one day. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, Cesar says, says, anyways, I love Ennis writing. Hitman, Enemy Ace, and Preacher are really good. Close call on his Punisher, close call to his Punisher run. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't have anything much to add to that. Uh, Tevia says, I don't. I also think Marvel needs to have their characters actually grow up and mature. Like, say, I don't know, have Peter Parker and Mary Jane get remarried and have them become parents to their children. Yeah, that's... Certainly there's a need for progress, but a lot of other writers throughout comic book history have shown that they can kind of skew that a little bit and find ways to have this character development without it feeling like 
no other writer can follow them again. And uh, I do think Marvel also needs to let go a little bit and let their characters grow and change and just start doling out infinity formulas if there's concern about them aging up or something like that. Who cares? Uh, Cesar says, what do you think about Larry Hama's writing style? Uh, I like it. I think he's a really interesting writer. I loved his thing for Avengers, as we reviewed, but he does a lot of like G.I. Joe books and stuff like that. And he's good. He's... He's just so interesting and different. And the, the G.I. Joe books are a good example because he was just trying out all this different stuff. He did like early silent issues in the 90s and stuff like that. I, I really like his style to answer your question. <laughs> uh, oh, I see. Teddy says, speaking of which, that reminds me, would you like to do a video on Future State versus Future Zen? Because it feels like both futures I thought were a mess. Well, that's interesting. I haven't read nearly enough of Future State to have an opinion one way or another, so uh, I will do so and then kind of give that consideration, Tevia. <laughs> uh, Raphael says, uh, with all the success of Marvel and DC movies now, to think this... or they, one think, uh, you're, He's saying he, one would think this would help uh, future comic sales with the young fans of the movies. Well... But you have to have it in a way that kids can buy it or that parents know to get their kids it. Like, so that's what I was talking about, like the Scholastic Book Program. Kids do read comics, but they're called like Wind and Chew and Dogman and stuff. They don't have anything to do. And like you said, you're right. With all these blockbuster movies, you'd think kids would, there's this, this connection would be made. But DC's only now just starting to get into this market and, and, and Marvel. Like a decade too late, decades too late if we're being realistic. So I, I, I think they can broach in because they have the in of the DC and Marvel movies. It's just embarrassingly late. And that's why I said like a lot of the struggles Raphael was talking about in terms of sales, I chalk up to this mismanagement and this disconnect between comic book stores and comic book movies that uh, nobody's married. And part of the reason for that too is like the way something like Marvel is organized where they're kind of in different departments and the dude who's in charge of Marvel Comics is so toxic and terrible that the dude who runs with the Marvel movies wants nothing to do with him. Correctly. Um, so, uh, it, it, like, that marriage isn't going to be fixed by Marvel anytime soon, I don't think. Uh, Cesar says, Tomasi's stuff has always been entertaining. Full agree. Him and Tinny and the Fourth, who unfortunately kind of broke into DC Comics around the same time, and so I get their names confused a lot are both consistently awesome writers in my experience. I haven't really read like a lot, like a series of books by them that I dislike. Let's put it that way. You know, one here and there, there might be an issue I don't particularly respond to. And that kind of gets into this whole discussion. But broadly speaking, like uh, that also kind of gets into things where you do get these consistent writers that you can kind of expect something good out of, but what is good. And I think that gets into for me, so often it's what sparks my own imagination and what gives me ideas or like makes me excited. And again, that gets into what Andre said like 10 minutes ago about uh, uh, like, what do you connect with? What do I connect with? What do you as readers connect with? And I think to a strong degree, that is the entire thesis of every review I've ever done. <laughs> uh, it's all just a discussion about how I did or didn't connect with it and what my emotional response to it was. Uh, and I think that is the most appropriate way to do a review. Uh, and we can, t and sometimes, you know, the, the, the comic or the movie might do something interesting with structure or artwork that is worth talking about and interesting. And that might inform an opinion as to whether a book is good or bad. But I think what ultimately decides it is not necessarily art or writing or anything like that, but how all these things come together in forming a connection with the reader. And unfortunately, well, the way the world works, I don't think there's ever going to be like one perfect book that connects with everybody equally. And I don't think that's the way it should be, because like I said, this is a positive thing. There can be a discussion. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I read a question, but I'll go in order for now in chat. <laughs> um, but it's an interesting question, and we'll get to that in a second. John Pierce says, J.J. Abrams' Spider-Man was a story I thought was bad on both a creative level and a story level, except for the father-son talks. It wasn't without value. I just That was an example to me of someone who doesn't really care much about what Spider-Man's done before or what's been converted before and just came into it like, yeah, me and my son are just going to 
outclassed them all and they they really didn't uh which didn't surprise me um because of all that like the, the ego thing i was talking about and that also jeff sorry jj abrams while he can be a good director is a terrible writer <laughs> uh, and that just bears out in the movies that he writes versus the ones that he only redirects and it's a whole thing uh tevia says i did love jeff john's flash but i was really annoyed that wally west got screwed over for barry allen to return which is just frustrating because a lot of people grew up with wally west as uh the flash well you'll notice i and uh there's kind of a similar issue with kyle rayner and hal jordan so sometimes you do have to take these risks and kind of go out on a limb I think the return of Barry Allen was all but inevitable, and he has kind of been used effectively since then, along with Wally West, so I'm not necessarily against it. Uh, I've never really connected with Jeff John's Flash, though, and it's good that you did. I just, uh, I, the ha I'm like sitting on a bunch of books by him for The Flash that I haven't really like worked my way through because I just haven't had the motivation for it, I guess. Um, and that, I think, has to do with the story, like the book itself, not so much like me uh, if there's a book that i want to read i'll read it if there's others that i care less about i tend to sit on them for a while until the mood strikes me cesar says uh wally is more interesting than barry i respect barry he said it's in brackets uh the wade run on the flash was amazing well i am generally a fan of mark wade although uh mark wade's journey on grading the avengers might not be totally positive <laughs> but uh broadly speaking i like mark wade and i did like his flash books and i even like some of the more well yeah flash is very come and go for me um but i think there's room enough for a world where there's a wally west a barry allen a kyle rayner and a hal jordan and i actually like the world of dc better now that there's multiple versions of these heroes running around, including two versions of Wally West. Because why not? It, that's just, why, why not? It's fun. <laughs> I, I, I honestly can't think of a reason that, like, uh, like to really object to that. It's just like, oh, you have both. Whatever one you like more will turn up sooner or later in books. So I, I quite enjoy that personally. Uh... Yeah, okay, well, <laughs> Cesar says, same feelings for Kyle over Hal on Green Lantern, but I just said that. Uh, and then Raphael says, uh, do you think uh, you will be reading comics till your time comes? An interesting question I've thought about before, so I'll just say, yeah. Um, well, I definitely don't want to be working my like other job for the rest of my life, necessarily. I uh, don't really intend to stop making YouTube videos ever. I like doing this, I like reviewing comics, and plan to just keep doing so in some form or another until I can't anymore. Which is a grim thing to think about, but uh, it's just, uh, I like doing it. Andre says, I also think that both DC and Marvel, which is actually a very appropriate question for this stream, I feel. Uh, Andre says, I also think that both DC and Marvel often fail to utilize and capitalize on their lesser known, but extremely fascinating characters, like Booster Gold, Baby Doll, or Great Lakes Avengers. Um, in interesting ways yeah um you know andre i don't disagree i think uh dc often makes that mistake in spite of efforts to move in that direction with stuff like 52 however in their defense we as a fan base also do that to them i, I can like without me having to even look at sales charts although the sales charts bear this out too Anything with like a big name on it, like Batman, Spider-Man, Superman, that sort of thing, is much more likely to get views and attention, comments and discussion than something obscure. To be honest, I'm surprised this video has had like a big audience and a healthy discussion in the stream because I wasn't sure it wasn't really a specific topic around any specific characters. And I kind of just decided to put Crystal on the thumbnail for some reason. So. And I didn't really have anything in mind with her when I had it on there. It's just some artwork I had lying around from uh, the 90s Avengers stuff and just went with it. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. Uh, Tevia says, In fact, I maintain they really need to get rid of Ike Perlmutter and have a new person have Marvel Comics and the movie people at least help each other. Well, that'd be great. I was referring to Ike Perlmutter when I was talking about the dude in charge of comics that's terrible. Uh, I just didn't really, uh, but yeah, I, I, Ike Perlman has got to go. I think he's like contracted in for now, which occurred when Disney bought out Marvel or something like that, which is the only reason he's still around because I, nobody wants to work with him. 
Not unless they kind of... Yeah, like, he's just a whole thing. The, good, the only good news is he's kind of like a weird recluse, so I don't think... I don't know how much he's, like, actively involved at the office and stuff, but he definitely, like, creates these situations for people and is involved in discussions and phone calls for sure. So, who, who knows? Um, Cesar says, Actually, I'm looking forward to read Wade's run on Daredevil. I have the books, but not the time. You know, a lot of people don't like it, but personally, I enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was interesting, different, and very colorful for Daredevil in a, in, a, in a cool way. In a way that I was talking about before, where it's like, yeah, it's different for the character. It kind of it, it goes in its own direction co compared to past Daredevil books. But I also liked it. And uh, it, it, it was not doing it for no reason. It didn't do it without an absence of sense of like stuff that's come before. And uh, personally, I think it was a pretty good run. Cesar says, I would love to see a TV show on the Giffen to Mattis run on Justice League. See, and that kind of gets into what you, um, Andre was saying before about different characters getting a focus. And something like Justice League International, which he's referring to there, would be amazing for like a, CW, uh, a TV show. I almost said CW, but to be honest, yeah, like even as a CW show, that could be fun if it was done right in a way that actually evoked the JLI books in a, like with their humor and their kind of quirky nature. I'd be all for that. Whether or not they'd pull it off, I don't know. However, Legends of Tomorrow is kind of that tone. And I would argue it's one of CW's better superhero shows because of it. Like they're willing to just go places and be weird and funny and goofy. And I maintain that shows better because of it. <laughs> and that kind of gets into what I was saying before about like, I think what, the thing about pushing boundaries, it's not that stories have to do it. When they do that, they get people excited and emotionally invested, especially like including me. Um, and, and I think that's what stories do as well as they push our ideas and push the envelope so that new stuff can be explored. When I was a kid, the phrase like push the envelope was always treated like a bad thing, but I don't believe that to be so. I think trying new things is a key part of getting people emotionally invested and liking stories. I'm trying to maintain sort of a central thesis around this video, I guess, so that there is kind of an answer. I don't love the, uh, the kind of blanket discussions where I'm just sort of throwing it out there. It's like, no, I think we collectively, me and the lovely people in chat, are kind of arriving at answers and a sense of what makes a comic good and bad because i think there is it's not objective but and it, but it is something we can objectively draw around these subjective terms because it is subjective whether or not you connect with something but we can talk about that in in objective terms about well that will often dictate whether or not people like a book more than any other factor uh and that's just kind of me uh uh, doing its own thing. Light One Film says, what are good comics for a beginner to get into comics? I like Mar Marvel and DC. Well, I think I'd have to do some research on this, but I, I feel as though it's so complicated because it's just been going on for years and years. And sometimes the best thing to do is just pick a series that people like and recommend to you and just stick with it and run your way through it. Personally, like, my instinct was to tell you, well, like, I started by reading some Alan Moore graphic novels, and then I got into stuff like Ultimate Spider-Man and just read through the whole thing, and that was a solid introduction to Spider-Man comics. Uh, I kind of went through all the Ultimate comics, because that was like a good, okay, here's a smaller, more limited run of a shared universe that is kind of like a rough approximation of the main Marvel comics, so then you can kind of graduate your way into Marvel Comics and start more rapidly catching up there. I found that very effective for me. I don't know if that's true for everyone else, though, and that might not be the best way to do it. 52 is a DC book, and I found that was a great 52-issue run that'll teach you about so many other DC characters, and there's all these other little bonus details in it that like, go into the history of the DC universe and all these other stuff. So it gets you to... It's a real way to kind of catch you up on things and get you knowing more about DC stuff outside of, uh, uh, like, um, oh shoot, what was I just trying to say? I read something in chat and got distracted. Uh, 52 gets you kind of outside of the big three, like Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, because they're not around for that story. And it even gets you past like major Justice League characters. So you start learning more about characters like Steel and the question 
cool, interesting characters like what Andre was talking about. Unfortunately, it's not a good representation of comics as like DC Comics as a whole, but it kind of gets you more motivated in that direction. Um, and then I'm sure people will also be giving stuff in chat because I've, I've lost track of the original comment and uh, chat's kind of flying by me now. So I'm just going to read comments as best I can. But hopefully that kind of gives you at least some starting points. Also, Google it. That's not a, that's kind of a rude thing to say, but like there's some, so many great little guides and lists for getting you started on things like that. And I do want to make a video along those lines at some point in the future where it's like, these are the 10 best books that I've identified over time. Uh, I don't really like that. Let me just go over here. Oh, no. I ran over a wire. <laughs> uh, there we go. I just wanted to be a little more centered and frank because I keep gesturing. <laughs> um... Cesar says, in your opinion, top five best comic book writers in comic book history. That's the kind of thing I'd have to sit down and make a list and probably a whole video out of. But uh, sure, here, I will indulge you <laughs> and write it down as a future thing to do. But we're going to do 10. <laughs> I don't love being put on the spot for stuff like that. Not that I don't like your comment. It's just like... I'd rather think about that and give you a fully edited answer. <laughs> uh, the Shadowcatcher says, What makes a comic book good? Great storytelling and awesome artwork to support the story. Well, that's definitely part of it. And like I said, that's almost like a prerequisite for being like an objectively good comic. Uh, but you can kind of skew that a little bit and have a really interesting comic with like not the best artwork in the world or a really cool looking comic with some rough bits of writing here and there that you, one almost overlooks because the writing's so interesting. That's actually why I like Terry Kavanaugh's Avengers so much on grading the Avengers, even though the plot and a lot of people don't like the story for those books. It's like, eh, I don't really care. I just like the artwork so much. It almost doesn't matter to me. Uh, and I, but I didn't go so far as to say those comics were great either for that reason, because I did recognize the story doesn't live up to the artwork quite as much. <laughs> Uh, Tevi says, and another example I can think of of making a terrible comic is making a story not make any sense, like the new 52. Um, well, that kind of gets into stuff I was saying about, like, uh, the threshold of plot holes. Like, at a certain point, a plot hole is so egregious that even if people like a story, they can't help but notice the plot hole and basically have to start making excuses for it, even if they like the story. Um, and that is interesting. Cesar agrees with Shadowcatcher, and, uh, like, I certainly think that's a fundamental element of it. I just think those fundamental elements are key for people connecting with the story. You need a story that looks like you need it for a comic. You need something that looks good and makes sense and reads well in order to connect with it. So that's why I was just like, I, I, I'm, I'm bringing it all back to this because I really do think that is the most fundamental core part of a story. The most important thing is whether or not it makes that connection because you can have a comic with good writing and good art, but if you don't make that connection, it's not going to be one of your favorites. It's not going to be one of my favorites and it's not going to get talked about. And that's difficult. That's the challenge of someone being a writer. Um, Bucket Think Tank says, I like a glorious train wreck, if anything, when it comes to stories. If a story crashes and burns, I like to see at least something of value in it. Uh, Tom King's Batman felt like a glorious wreck at times. Well, that's interesting. And there are, that's almost a whole other thing. Uh, the so bad it's good kind of thing. And that, I would argue, actually isn't in the objectively bad territory. It's close to it, though. It's like an inch in, away from it. And it's like there's just enough that you can kind of enjoy it. Um, I, t I mentioned Red Letter Media f before. They like watching bad B-movies, and that's the whole point of their Best of the Worst series is talking about those things and kind of like vicariously enjoying it. But I would argue that's a bit different than what we're talking about today. They don't really connect with those stories emotionally, but as a part of a shared social experience, they're vicariously enjoying it. I also kind of like reviewing bad comics on here sometimes because it's fun. And I do sometimes get a little excited when I read a book that's just spectacularly bad that I know I get to tear apart online because there is something fun about us all collectively as a little group hating on something. Uh, it's very human, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it as long as we don't use that as a reason to harass anybody. For example, we can all hate one more day, but that doesn't give us license to harass Joe Quesada. Joe Quesada is an adult that can handle it, but he doesn't deserve that kind of treatment, 
and nobody does working in the comic book industry, especially when they're putting their heart and soul into these things. Um, so navigating that's important too. <laughs> uh, comic book fan gaming says you should try Transformers twenty nineteen comic. It rebooted the Transformers. It's really great. We did recently review a Transformers series, the one that crossed over with the Terminator, and I loved it. <laughs> um, so uh, we can check out more uh, Transformers books in the future. Yeah, I'll, while I have my list of stuff to do, I'll add that to it. <laughs> I'm going to write more Transformers books. <laughs> Oops. There we go. Um, Cesar says, New 52 is a huge failure except with exceptions for Batman, Aquaman. Sorry, with the exceptions for Batman, Aquaman, and Batman and Robin. Well, you know, I actually have more examples than that, too. There's, I made a whole video about like the top 10 New 52 comics, and that doesn't include those three titles, which I agree are pretty solid, but there's 10 whole other ones that I really love, too, if you want to go check that out. I don't mean to plug things. I'm just I'm like, well, I'm not going to repeat myself here. I just, you should check those out, because there's 10 other books out there you might like as well. <laughs> uh, comic Book Fan Gaming says, Transformers Beast Wars 2021 is greatness. You should read it. Great, too. <laughs> um... Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't know anything about that, but I watched Beast Wars back when it was uh, uh, like on TV in the 90s, and I enjoyed it enough, so I might enjoy that quite a bit. The Shadowcatcher says, New 52 wasn't bad, but I'd say a soft fail. That's actually a really good way of pu putting it. There are bad New 52 books, there are bad trends within the New 52 at large, uh, but I don't know if I'd go so far as to say the whole thing was a bad experience but I would kind of agree with Shadowcatcher when he calls it a soft failure uh, their sales weren't terrible but it did kind of peter out over time and a lot of books were cancelled along the way so it's not like it was all a success and I don't know if DC's response to it or the way it's viewed among the fan community could be called a success at all um, I don't think they view it that way Tevye says Spawn is also good probably in reference to what I was saying earlier uh, comic book fan ga gaming reiterating that says amazing books Shadowcatcher says rebirth was amazing then lost the momentum again 100% agree we were both Joey and I were 100% in the tank for rebirth in the early days and we were both so excited about these books and I think it kind of lost its way and then it's kind of been abandoned at this point but so far uh, uh, it, I'm optimistic about it uh, Tevye says, then it got destroyed by Dan Didio. Kind of, yeah. Uh, Cesar says, I tried Spawn and I didn't like it, to be honest, but I like Capullo's artwork. Well, Greg Capullo's a cool-as-hell artist and a stand-up dude, because I've actually met him, uh, and he's awesome. Uh, but uh, uh, Spawn... And I got to interview Capullo. He was very supportive, because that was one of the first interviews I ever did with any comic book person. And unfortunately, that's not available online for technical reasons, so... Uh, yeah, but he was a really cool dude, and uh, I definitely recommend any book by him. Uh, Spawn, though, I would say is definitely either an acquired taste or not for everyone. It's both. It's kind of an acquired taste, and it's not for everyone, so I wouldn't feel bad if you didn't connect with it. Like, that's fine. It, it is what it is. its own thing, and not everyone will connect with it. I personally like... Todd McFarlane, and I'm supportive of his plans for the future of Spawn, though. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Raphael's saying, I think, like, what you and everyone are saying in chat about, like, it kind of coming down to an emotional connection are correct. And, uh, like, I, I agree with you. I very much enjoy your discussion and you bringing in these things, though, Raphael, and I do appreciate it. I, I And, like, I don't want to disagree with you too hard. I was more disagreeing with the broader thoughts behind what you were saying that I've heard other people say, to be clear. Because um, I, I, I like I appreciate you, you're, you and Chad as much as everyone. Uh, Carlos says, uh, what are your thoughts on Dan Slott's Fantastic Four? I feel like that's an example of a comic that has so much potential, but it's so dull in certain places. I think that's a solid example of where you have like writing where it's hard to find anything where it's like, oh, this is what's wrong with it. And artwork where that's pretty excellent, but I don't really connect with it. And so it doesn't really become this huge part of my like pull list or anything like that because I just I don't really connect with it. <laughs> and uh, and I think yeah like uh, Carlos is saying like when he's saying oh it's dull in certain places I, I kind of agree. It's like well yeah like there's plenty of books out there that do have drier moments that I love, 
but with the Fantastic Four, I'm not making this connection, and it's I, I kind of lost interest in it over time, unfortunately. But uh, I don't have a lot of love for Dan Slott either, because as Tevia says, Dan Slott's Spider-Man is so bad that could be used as a way to vent frustration. That's almost an example of it, because like, and I, and when I was talking about stuff where it's like, like Clone Conspiracy by Dan Slott was a good example of something where I started reading it, and I got a little excited because I knew. I would be able to just sit in front of a mic and rant for 20 minutes about how bad it is. And I did. <laughs> uh, Tevia says, New 52 Teen Titans and New 52 Superboy are both bad. Interestingly enough, I personally disagree. I didn't love either of those series, but I didn't hate either of them either. And I kind of like New 52 Teen Titans, or at least Scott Lobdell's version. Once it got rebooted for DCU, no, I'm not a fan. <laughs> uh, so it depends on what new 52 you're talking about. <laughs> Raphael says, I also used to watch it, watch Beast Wars as a kid. I used to watch it before going to school in the morning. That's cool. Where I live, it played after school. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Um, comic book fan says, personally for me, who's trying to work his own comic book, I find every writer should have, or I feel every writer should have this mindset for comics. Do your own story. Don't appeal to fan service. That, yeah, definitely. You definitely, I think once you, once a writer starts catering to what they think fans want or what fans say they want, they are doing themselves a disservice because often there's so many books that it's not like that I'll read and be like, well, I didn't know I wanted it until I read it, but this is exactly like, this is amazing and I want it now. <laughs> like uh, sometimes a writer has to take the lead a little bit and kind of push things in their own direction. Um, comic book fan says, personally for me, who's trying to work on his own comic, I feel every writer should have this mindset. Oh wait, I just read that. <laughs> uh, Caesar says, Vendetti's Hackman run, did you like it? I love it. <sighs> yeah, I, I did like it. Vendetti is interesting. Like I really liked his Justice League, uh, thing for example. So it kind of really depends on, uh, where, like, uh, he's a bit hit or miss for me. Let's put him that way. And that's interesting how some writers do that and some don't. But I think that comes down to, I connect with some writers more than others. And so I kind of associate some writers with being better than others. And then, because, you know, like, some fans kind of agree, like, a certain consensus will emerge or others are more reliable. I think a good example is Scott Snyder. I personally tend to connect with his stories more than, like, the average reader, I find. So I tend to like a lot of Snyder books. Uh... On the other hand, you have someone like Tomasi, and he tends to appeal to a lot of different people. And he tends to be a bit more of a popular writer because of it. And good for him. Like, right? What's wrong with that? <laughs> I, I, I almost called him a broad writer, but that sounds more like an insult than I meant it to. And that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, he, he just connects with people more. It's not a negative thing in and of itself. Uh, comic Book Fan Gang says, if it's a particular character like Spider-Man or Superman... If you do, you killed your comic book. Oh, I see. Like in response to, yeah, like these changes can kill a comic book because once you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to give a glad of mess of milk and that's how it becomes a mess. I get what he's saying there. It's like the whole Zack Snyder thing where it's like, well, if you give fans what they want too much, then their demands kind of become a thing. This is awesome. Okay, well, hold on. There's a couple of questions before it though, but I read something very interesting in chat. Cesar says, who wrote the best Daredevil in your opinion? Quesada, Bendis, Wade, or Brubaker? What a question. Um, oddly enough, I'm going to go with my instinct. Because when you asked the question, I thought of it for a second. And I said, Bendis. <laughs> and I was like, oh, geez. But you know what? Yeah. Out of those four books, I think the one that's most cemented in my mind as like a classic Daredevil one is Bendis. It's a weird thing. It's a really weird thing, considering I just said Bendis is a writer that generally I don't connect with. But a lot of Bendis' older books, uh, Jessica Jones, Daredevil, and Ultimate Spider-Man, which I also recommended earlier in the stream, I really like and I do connect with. And I, and I do, really, like, there is a side of Bendis I really like. And all too often it just falls to the wayside for crap. And if you look at Bendis' body of work, I would say I like about maybe 80, or sorry, 20% of his books. And 80% I don't. So it's a real weird ratio. But out of his, out of those Daredevil choices you gave me, I think my answer is Bendis. But that is an interesting question, isn't it? And uh, 
I, I surprised myself with that answer. <laughs> but it came to me right away, too. So, like, I kind of feel pretty strongly about that. <laughs> Uh, Bucket Think Tank says, New 52 Wonder Woman was interesting, but the story didn't really handle the transition from Azarello to Finch, and the book always felt so removed from the rest of the DC universe. Now that's interesting. You are one of the first people I've ever, like, even heard from a YouTube comment that likes Azarello's Wonder Woman as much as I do. I really liked it and connected with it. And I was willing, and I think because of that, I was willing to overlook a lot of criticisms I've heard since then that I think do have some merit. Uh... But I also agree, I completely lost interest in the book once it got turned over to the Finches. <laughs> and uh, it did also kind of feel off in its own little world and didn't often connect with the Wonder Woman or like the rest of the DC stuff. Since then, people have pulled stuff from Wonder Woman and been like, oh, look at all these like horrible gender things Azarella put in that I really didn't pick up on on the first time reading it. And I'd have to kind of revisit and see if it was really there. But personally, I thought... Azrael's Wonder Woman made her into such a strong character and also filled her little world up with all these interesting little like side characters. Uh, Hera becomes this major figure in a way that I like and you kind of just fall in love with all these sort of extra characters that are like I think Hermes is it is like a major thing. It, it's all very interesting and even characters like Poseidon and Hades kind of take on their own personality in a way I, I liked. <laughs> So it's just amazing that uh, I just, uh, like I said, I don't often meet people who also like the New 52 Wonder Woman. Uh, I think I did put that on my top 10 New 52 comics, though, because it is one of my favorites. In spite of all the problems people have with it, I connected with it. So to me, it's good and I like it just to kind of bring it back around to the whole point of the stream. But then in a really interesting comment, uh, Cesar says, agreed, I met Capullo on the Toronto Comic Con 2012, amazing guy, I love his energy and good vibes. That is so cool because I met Azarello at Fan Expo in Toronto. <laughs> um, oh God, what year was it? Here, I can look that up right now and tell you. We're just gonna do that real quick. <laughs> uh, I met him. Oh. Oh, it's not showing up anymore. That's weird. There we go. 2016 is where I met Capullo there, though. So that's kind of fun. I wasn't sure what year, and I was like, oh, it wouldn't have been 2012, but it's like, was it for a second? Uh, Tevi says, New 52 Flash, and I thought it was a mess. Yeah, we don't need to revisit every New 52 title. I don't actually, I'm blanking on it right now. I don't even remember what that was all about. <laughs> um, uh, Carlos says, I thought Chip Zarsky should have taken over Fantastic Four. I just butchered his name, Story Chip. I think you spelled it correctly, sir. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I believe so. I think I pronounced it correctly, too. But uh, uh, Fantastic, he would be the perfect choice for Fantastic Four, and we actually got a little taste of that for their crossover with the X-Men that happened recently. And I think I said that, that he should write the Fantastic Four. He's the perfect kind of writer for it because he's got a great sense of humor, but he can also do serious and epic moments really well too. I, Zartsky is one of my favorite contemporary writers, to be honest, at the moment. He's very reliable, I find. Well, okay, maybe not my favorite, but he, he is very reliable. Comic Book Fan says, I thought the new 52 Wonder Woman was great. Hey, okay, so we're not alone. That's great. <laughs> Uh, I just find a lot of people dislike it. And there's nothing wrong with disliking it. I think it just comes down to if you don't connect with it, it doesn't work. But the whole idea of Wonder Woman becoming the god of war and this relationship she has with Ares, I thought was very interesting. And uh, But some people hate that, for example. And I think it's whether or not you connect to that whole almost father-daughter relationship that's part of that story, uh, we'll say. <laughs> Raphael says, the comic book sales are not what they used to be. With the current success of WandaVision and the hype of Snyder Cut, should the show should show the comic book industry what we want our heroes for life? There's some interesting points there. Um, yeah, I think that's a whole other thing too. I don't want to be like too down on it. It's just that that's an interesting point. Uh, for as for the comic book sales, yeah, that's complicated. But like I said, that isn't true if you factor in Scholastic. So. It just becomes like, oh yeah, people aren't buying like Superman comics as much as they used to, but they're buying Chew instead. And that that's all on DC. <laughs> um, 
same thing with like Amulet and that graphic novel series and stuff. So, you know. Um, Cesar says, now with 90s Batman, in your opinion, who wrote it better, Dixon, Grant, or Munch? Um, my personal favorite is Chuck Dixon, but uh, those are three pretty solid choices you got there. <laughs> uh, and 90s Batman was pretty cool, in my opinion, from what I've read of it. I haven't read like the whole decade or anything like that, but uh, there's a lot of gems in there. And from what we reviewed of that era for Batman, like it's all been pretty awesome. Uh, like for this channel, that, that is to say. Uh, comic book fan says, I love Brian Michael Bendis' Marvel work, but his DC work, no thanks, that kills. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Uh, uh, or that kills me, he says. Uh, uh, I get what you're saying there. Um, yeah, I 100% I, uh, agree. It's, uh, well, I don't, I, there's actually vast swaths of Brian Michael Bendis' Marvel work that I run, but or, that I dislike too. But when he moved over to DC, it's been very unreliable to the extent the only thing I really have liked out of him is Naomi. And a lot of people don't connect with that book and don't like it. Um, and that gets into what I was saying. But I did connect with it, so I, I liked it. <laughs> um, I hate to keep breaking it down like that, but that was the kind of central thesis of this stream. So I just kind of kind of connect everything because this is kind of like some sort of super review that's kind of like explaining my mindset and thought process behind all of my reviews, like I was saying earlier. And uh, so I kind of want to show how it connects with everything. Uh, like any discussion in the world of comics is this discussion. So this is all kind of related. Um... Tevye says, New 52 Teen Titans by Scott Lobdell I thought was a mess. Well, there you go. We just disagree. And that's fine. Uh, I just weirdly connected with it when I read it. Uh, and I, uh, or not connected with it. I just, like, I thought it was a lot better than I thought it would be. Let's put it that way. Um, but we'll get into it pretty heavily because uh, we're going to talk about it and other Teen Titans books in the future. Um... Comic book fan gaming says I thought it was amazing. Yeah, I don't know if I'd go so far as amazing, but I did like it. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Tevye Smoka says, uh, I agree, Bendis' DC work is just bad. And uh, I found new, and then Tevye goes on to say, I found new 52 Wonder Woman was just a mess. Having her being a daughter of Zeus really made no sense to me. Oh, well, that made a lot more sense to me and still does than her, like the whole clay thing or even some of the stuff they were playing around with in Dead Earth. To be honest, that angle of it, I liked better than most other iterations of Wonder Woman's origin. Uh, it kind of informs her power a little more too, which I quite enjoy. Yeah, and then comic book fan says, sorry, I'm gonna be the one that's gonna be out there saying I'm not the biggest fan of Wonder Woman's original origin. Well, I mean, I just echoed you, man. I'm right there with you. He said that before in chat, though. Uh, Tevia says, the problem with Diamond, the problem is with Diamond and their terrible distribution. You know, I don't entirely disagree, and that's why, like, uh, that's why I was kind of in support of DC breaking away with Diamond last year, and now other companies are considering that, too. And I'm like, yeah, like, screw Diamond. They have way too much power in this industry and cause a lot of these problems and lower sales that Raphael's referring to because of big part of this issue is that yeah well comic book sales of course they're not going to sell as much as they used to they used to be sold in like convenience stores and stuff like that so and we're well past those days but i think that's part of the issue is diamond got their claws on everything and seriously damaged the comic book industry in the process um Cesar says, as an X-Men moderate fan, the Dark Phoenix and Days of Future Past are the best X-Men arcs, period. But Whedon, Hickman, and Morrison runs, in my opinion, were really good and entertaining. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I actually kind of take a lot more value in uh, some of the current stuff going on with Hickman and don't tend to defer as much to the Claremont days in comparison, but that's just me. Uh, Tavia says, question, how would you fix the new 52? Yeah, I don't know. We don't need to revisit all that. Because fix is the wrong term. I think it really just kind of works into, uh, like, uh, the the best overall, uh, what am I trying to say? Like, sorry, like, it, it's not so much an issue of, like, super, I don't know. I don't know, I guess is my answer. Because Tavia's asking, how would I fix all this stuff with Superman and Superboy now? And it's like, well, I don't know if I 
Because it's not, it's a little hacky just to like wave it all away with the wand and all the stuff Bendis did, but I hate all the stuff Bendis did. So like to honestly answer your question, I don't know. And I would have to like sit down and think about it. And on that note, Cesar, like he was asking for the top 10, top five comic book, top five worst comic book writers. Uh, okay, here, sorry. I thought you were asking the same question again, but you're asking something different. All right, I'll, uh, I'll add both of these to the list. And then I'll give you a whole proper video to answer your question. How does that sound? <laughs> uh, two, two whole proper videos at some point in the future. Tevia says, I personally like her being made of clay, at least in my opinion. Well, you know, and that really just is a subjective thing. And that doesn't get into the whole, conne well, connective thing, because it's all just fanciful, magical nonsense. But that's why, like, when you were saying, oh, her being a daughter of Zeus makes no sense. I was like, well, the clay thing doesn't either. <laughs> It, it, uh, so I don't like you can't kind of like you know if you can, I don't feel it's fair to criticize the Zeus thing is not making sense if you're gonna support the clay thing, right? <laughs> six one six man says I like the post crisis DC Comics universe nineteen eighty six and two to two thousand eleven, and the post Secret Wars Marvel universe nineteen eighty five to two thousand and twelve. Well, fair enough. I uh, I personally kind of like that DC is kind of returning to pre-crisis, like, omniverse ideas, uh, but to each their own. A uh, good comic book fan says, for me, he can do good stories on DC, however, it's just if you give him the right character, like Batman. That Batman universe that he did was great. Uh, I think he's referring to Bendis. <laughs> Bucket Think Tank says, I, which is interesting. I haven't read Batman Universe, so... Uh, Bucket Think Tank says, I always found her being made from clay had nothing to do with her being Wonder Woman. Hey, that's fair, right? The whole clay thing just seems like some sort of incidental detail. Um, Cesar says, yeah, post-crisis DC still being the best period. Agreeing with uh, 616 dude from earlier. Uh, comic book fan gaming says personally for me I think comic books should go ahead into digital because not every comic book can do well on sales yeah but like Stan Lee said this decades ago where he's like yeah, there's still going to be room for the digital market but there's nothing quite like holding a comic in your hands and also some people can't get or don't want digital there's also all this so it, like you don't own digital books in a certain way like if those companies ever go bankrupt or something like that your access to them is tentative at best. So I, I don't hate it. And especially in the wake of the pandemic, when I started collecting more physical copies in part because I could afford to do so, I definitely prefer it where I can. And there is something really nice about having a physical copy in your hands. So I don't, I think there is plenty of room for the digital marketplace, but I don't believe it'll ever fully replace it. Uh, and it's also a lot easier to be like, here, here's the book for you to physically try out yourself and to hand to a friend or something like that that can't be replicated in the digital marketplace. Uh, Tevye says, call me crazy or call me insane. I personally would be all on board with Bendis on a question book because maybe he can do that character justice without screwing him up. Um, personally, I don't think that's a good fit. Although, well, maybe you're right because I, I was suddenly thinking, well, he did a good job with Jessica Jones. So maybe if he evoked that and kind of did his own thing with the question, he just doesn't seem like the right type of writer for that particular character, in my opinion. Uh, Bucket Think Tank says, The most I've ever liked about Wonder Woman's origin is in the true Amazon, which to me felt like an origin that put her more in line with Green Lantern, Batman, and Superman. I haven't read that, so I'll have to check that out. Uh, Raphael says, So if DC and Marvel came to an Asgardian, what do we need to connect to new comic book readers? Uh, I would say you need to... Ignore some of the fans and really just yeah, like make things in line with the movies as best we can. Um, and then just make books fun and easy and accessible and being like more options for being like start here for new readers. And I shouldn't really have to answer whoever asked it or earl like earlier in the stream, like what's a good book for new readers? It's like, I don't fault him for asking it. I feel like he should be able to walk into a comic book store and there should be options for him and it should be easier um i also would tell marvel and dc to stop freaking telling their writers what to do which they do all the time and giving them more freedom would allow for more dynamic books that people would connect with because 
way too often there's too many shenanigans going on behind the scenes that we find out about that explain so many frustrating things that are often what cause people to lose that connective tissue with these books. Um, and then just, like, I think we need to kind of think more about trades and making things more accessible like that and not necessarily having it have to be a comic coming out every month for a series and stuff and letting things be a little more dynamic and fluid would help a lot. So getting past the like page limit of books and trying out different things. I would argue to a huge extent, if these two companies came to me now, I would say to a large extent, keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> That's a weird answer to them. But if we're talking about what Marvel and DC have been doing in the last few couple of years, they are making these inroads into like a younger reader market. They are trying out different things with the black label stuff and uh, different kinds of writers and giving people more of a chance for stuff and allowing for a more authentic take on diversity. And I would just say, yeah, keep that up because the more they do of that, the more they're gonna be able to sell these books and find that connective tissue. And they often do find like these narrow little readers things. And we re reviewed Runaways recently and it was like, yeah, it's amazing how long this book's been running, but it just keeps trucking along. <laughs> uh, Cesar says, Claremont lost the touch in the 90s. He got stuck, I agree. And that kind of gets into what we were talking about the X-Men earlier. Uh, Comic Book Fan Gaming says, I'm just going to say this right now. Bendis is a good writer, so it, it's just I'm going to have to say you have to take a risk. And you do have to take risks. You always have to take risks. Yeah, Tavio was saying that too. Um, and that would be something I would say to both companies in answer to Raphael's question from shortly before. Um, Cesar says, the Grell run on Green Arrow post-crisis is so good. I also really like the, like, I think one of my favorite things is Dennis O'Neill's take on Green Lantern and Green Arrow when they were just traveling across the U.S. debating politics in the 70s. And that was fun times. <laughs> um, <laughs> Alec Aquino says, what happened to the other guy? He's busy. There's a pandemic going on and he's got little kids to take care of at the moment. But Joey will be around, and we've talked a lot about maybe getting him on stream at some point in the future. He kind of has an open invitation for me to like host one of those little events for him or something if he wants to. But uh, yeah, he's got real life things to worry about at the moment. But he's not gone, and does do a lot of stuff behind the scenes still. <laughs> uh, Tevia says, the question I was referring to was Scott Lobdell, New 52 Super... Oh, okay. Uh, no worries. That's interesting, though. Uh, so you're saying Lobdell should write the question? Oh no, you said Bendis, so you're talking about the other writer from before. Well, that's still interesting. I don't know how much Lobdell should be writing comics at all anymore. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. One, a 616 man says, the modern ages of comics from the mid-80s to early 2010s is pretty good time for me when I first got into comics, and I had a lot of mature tones and darker stuff around these times. You know, the thing about that is a lot of the, the like early 2000s books I revisit and those are the like big formative ones for me that like I kind of got into as well, like that got me into books and a lot of them don't hold up as well. And if we're being honest and like you kind of get past your feelings of connection to these books and don't let oneself be turtled into a specific era, uh, there are good books across all of comic book history, like including today and um I think it's important to kind of be like honest about that stuff and not let nostalgia rule supreme because according to comments and viewers like you every every time period under the sun is the golden age of comics and when comics were worth reading and those days are long gone and they're not doing x y and z right and everything's wrong in the present it's very easy to quarterback all this stuff but uh and I, I'm very guilty of that too, but it, like, I, I don't entirely love the people that just dismiss entire time periods. It's like, well, have you read like anything from Image in that time or what? Like, cause it, it's like, it, it's, it's a little difficult to, I, I don't know what to say other than it's a little difficult to take that opinion seriously just because there's so much interesting stuff. You could take Marvel alone and be like, yeah, like they did amazing things in the last decade as much as they did bad stuff. <laughs> um, 
not to be too rude, it's just a state of my opinion. Zachariah, thanks for joining us. He's like, sorry I'm late, but you know, we've been going for a really long time, so it's all, it's all good. <laughs> Cesar says, Superman is a difficult character to write about. In your opinion, who will be the perfect writer for him? Plus, who will be the perfect artist for that writer? Oh, I don't know. You don't really know until you see it, right? I would like to see Stegman draw him. No, but you're asking what the perfect writer is. Like, I don't, I don't know that um, question. <laughs> uh, it's interesting and stuff, but uh, yeah. Uh, Zachariah says, The Ultimates got me into comics because it felt like something new to the Ultimate Universe. That was me too with Ultimate Spider-Man, but just in recent times, then I came into the 616 comics. Yeah, uh, and I was saying that earlier. That's a great way to kind of break into comics and sort of move into uh, 616. But, uh, yeah. Okay, I feel like uh, that's a, probably a pretty good discussion at this point, though. Um, because now we're kind of bouncing all over the place in chat. People are trying to co-opt it with their own discussions, so I think we're good there. So thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, this ended up being a very long and productive discussion, which is kind of cool. I did not really know what to expect out of this. Uh, and hopefully you all enjoyed it and maybe thought about how we, as the human race, evaluate fictional stories a little bit, because uh, that's kind of what this stream was about. And I really do appreciate everyone chatting with me throughout this whole thing. It was a good discussion. Um, yeah. Well, okay, before we go, Sakura does have one last interesting comment. He says, DC should do their own Ultimates to get new readers, not like the new 52. It's an interesting idea. I feel like they've kind of flirted with it before that was the only thing. And uh, I don't know if Marvel should ever do like an Ultimate Comics thing again. It's a little messy and it worked for me, but like I said, it might not work for everyone. So yeah, but uh, thanks again, guys. Have a good one, and we'll see you next time here on Comic Island.